that certainly has been something I've been reflecting a lot on. And that is the call to lift up, lift up in prayer and lift up in encouragement. uh, Everybody. And I think about our ministry council who need our encouragement in prayer. And I think about Pastor Connie. And I think even pray for me and my family. You know, we need to be lifted up and prayed for in this, in this season as we are preparing for transition as well. And uh, for, for Pastor Connie, we have six weeks or so that we have. And for my family and I, you have about six months or so. Uh, but we recognize that um, we need to be lifted up. And we need to be prayed for as a congregation, as leaders, as um, volunteers, as every aspect. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of uh, sadness and we can choose to come together and lift one another up. And we can choose to come together and say, Lord, we don't fully understand, but we're going to trust you. And we're going to lift these ones up. And we're going to believe by faith that you are going to do something brand new here in every single individual's life and in the life of this broader congregation. So may that be our position. May that be our posture as a church and as individuals. I want to talk to you about care today. And uh, I think it's highly relevant and one of the most important things we need to recognize is the least, is looking out for the least. And we're going to talk about, uh, about the priorities of the least, looking for the least or the little ones. But before we do that, let me just, uh, let me just highlight a few of these things that are probably becoming old hat to those of you that are coming here uh, week after week. Uh, this, these hopefully are being, becoming more and more ingrained in you. That we are a church that believes uh, that we are to be people of faith. We are to be people of faith, that confidence in God, uh, God's unseen work. We're to be people of love, that we are going to be caring for others without condition. We're to be people of integrity, that's living like Jesus in every season. And we are called to be people who are prepared to share. And we're abundantly free in the Spirit to give. Our identity, once again, we are generations following Jesus together, and our purpose is we are here to gather, and then we're sent out. We're we're going out from here. I read an article, actually, in uh, the Global Mail just yesterday, and I think uh, Erica mentioned this in McLean's as well. There's an article that just came out from uh, some some, uh, theological um, uh, professors uh, talking about the conservative church in Canada. So now this is a mainline uh, research project that looked at mainline denominations. And what they found is that those who are more conservative in their theological alignment, and one of the things they define conservatism, conservatism a- as is rather than a social gospel, okay, because this text is, that we're going to be talking about today is really largely used as a social gospel kind of text, right? Give a cup of cold water and give food and give clothing and all of those kind of things. That that is so important, but where the church is growing is where the church emphasizes not only that, but over against that is the power of Jesus Christ to change lives, and the churches that are saying to people and they're actually living it out, believing that it's only in and through Jesus Christ, regardless of the other stuff, it's only in and through Jesus Christ that we have hope and forgiveness and life. And it's the churches that are proclaiming that message. They're the churches that of the many, 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 many that are declining. Those are the churches that are actually growing. And so my prayer is that we would be, this would be, and long after I'm gone, this would be a church that continues to say we are sent forth from here with the good news of the gospel and we are going everywhere we can to be able to live and share the good news of Jesus Christ. So we are gathering, but we're also called to go. And then in our going, we're called to gather again and this wonderful kind of constant fluid movement of gathering and going. HMC seeks to become an intergenerational church in Hanover and the Grey Bruce region that gathers to worship God and welcomes people into an expanding network of groups following Jesus going into the world. Now we've been talking about things like discipleship and mission and we've been talking about uh, 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 worship and now this week we're going to talk about care and next week we're going to talk about family. And these are what our ministry council has put forward as these are kind of the, um, the, the central ingredients to the strategic plan, these, these uh, various areas. So we're going to talk a bit about care. Uh, so, so how do we see care in our, our, our logo? 
uh, if we were to take it all away, and, and each week I try to show you different, different aspects of this, care is really that green umbrella that surrounds, you notice those arrows coming down, right? Uh, so, so sometimes we can think of care as actually being, making sure we're taking care of those ones among us, but we, we don't want to see that umbrella shrinking. We want to see that umbrella continuing to grow, that we're gathering more people in, we're caring for more beyond where we are now, beyond the people that we have within our reach now. We continue to care. We continue to look after those ones. Those of you that are actually going home, and I know some of you are involved in groups during the week that actually study some of the things. You go a little bit deeper on the sermon. Uh, here's some texts for you to consider, because it's an interesting thing that Jesus, when he uses this term least or the little ones, and this week we're going to see this term, uh, whenever you've done these for one of the least of these, uh, this term least, anywhere we see Jesus using it in the Gospels, is actually used in the context of his followers. Okay? So when we think about the social gospel movement, that is the movement to take care of people's felt needs, the physical needs that people have, really not so much, it's, we're not so import, it's not so important that they receive Christ by faith, but it's really important that we go and care for them. Okay? Really, that's a bit of a distortion of the text because the text would see that the least of these, when you boil it all down, are actually the followers of Jesus, okay? So here's some texts for you to go home and study if you want to do a little extra study. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42, Matthew 10 and 42, Matthew 18 and 6, Matthew 18 and 10, and Matthew 18 and 14. So, so Matthew 10 verse 42 and then uh, Matthew 18, verses 6, 10, and 14. And I encourage you to go and you'll read these, this, these little ones or the least of these, this term that Jesus is using in this text. It's not to say that we should not be caring for the least of these, okay, for people that have, have uh, felt needs that are outside of the church. Absolutely not. That we, we should be doing those sorts of things. But it's to say Jesus' original message was really recognizing that it's really the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that are the least of these, right? And why is that? Because in the original context, those are the ones that are being put to death. Those are the ones that have given everything up. They have nothing left to live on or live for. They've given it all away for Jesus' kingdom. And Jesus is saying, you're the least, right? You have nothing left. You've abandoned it all for me, right? No one in the world at that time would look around and say, yeah, the Christians are the great ones, no, they're the ones that have given everything away. They have nothing left except for Jesus. And so, of course, Jesus is going to say the least of these. Now, the church in Canada is in a very different situation, right? Uh, and there's some things to grapple with because of that, uh, how, how difficult it is to actually live fully for Jesus because it's so easy to be constrained uh, by the things that, uh, of this world. Well, let me uh, share with you uh, how our, our council has defined our care as a congregation. As a congregation, we understand care to mean coming alongside those in need without conditions. We will focus on care through visitation, helping the hurting and lonely in practical ways, and feeding the vulnerable in spirit and body. As groups, we are committed to care for one another without conditions. Our groups are the primary means of care for individuals in our congregation. We desire all who are able to be part of a group, and that group will be among the first to know when a group members are sick, hurting, jobless, etc. We also encourage group members to visit, pray with, and offer practical help to other group members as expressions of care. Now, as individuals, we will care for those around us when we see an opportunity through being generous with our time, money, and possessions. We will look for ways to extend practical help and encouragement to our neighbors, fellow community members, and strangers along the way. So as you think about care today, I want you to take away or I want you to see that caring for the least should be one of our highest priorities. Caring for the least should be one of our highest priorities. Now, uh, I, I'm defining least here in these terms, least as those who have significant physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, or social needs, okay? The least being those with significant spiritual, physical, emotional, mental or social needs. I tremble when I approach this text uh, because not only is there life everlasting for those who have learned to care well, but there is destruction and death for those who have not cared well. So why? Why do we, uh, why should we learn to care for one of the least of these? 
And let's talk about that, but first let's, um, let's pray and then we'll look at the text. Our Father, thank you that your heart is with the least. Thank you that the good news of the kingdom is really about becoming less. It's acknowledging how hopeless and lost we actually are. And it's receiving you, Jesus Christ, by faith. I pray that we would get a good glimpse of you, Jesus, here today. I pray that it wouldn't just simply be something that uh, we, we think about, but something that we actually tangibly experience in our hearts. God, may we feel it in our gut. May we sense the care that you have so abundantly and freely given to us. And from that place, may we go forth from here to care well for other people. So speak to us, I pray. May you find us eager to respond. May you find us being healed in the name of Jesus. May you find us actually bringing hope and restoration in the name of Jesus as well. For we ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. Well, this is what the text says, uh, and and this is from the New International Version. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and following says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. And the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. That Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, there will no longer be a question of who is righteous and who is unrighteous. Who has received Christ and who has not received Christ? Uh, Jesus will make that clear. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needed clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whenever you did Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say, and this is the part we didn't read in the introduction, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for by the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I was, uh, sorry, I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, I tell you the truth, whenever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment and the righteous to eternal life. If you're, if you're astute, you will notice in the text that there is a gradual progression on both ends toward the middle text in chapter, in verse 40. You'll see that he begins by talking about the kingdom and then the righteous and how they, they, they did things for him and how they were confused by it. You'll see if you go work on the opposite direction from the bottom up, you'll see the same, uh, you'll see the same uh, way it's laid out with the focus on the recognition of Jesus in the least of these Jesus prioritized the least, and so should we. Let me offer you three reasons why it's important from this text, why it's important for us to care for the least. Number one is this. There's a judgment day. There's a day of judgment. That Jesus has died, he was buried, and then he came back to life. His his dead body actually came back to life. A little footnote here, by the way, I also read in the news that um, they're cryogenic, or how do you call it, how do you say it? You're the freezing people upon the moment of their death in the UK. There's a group that's doing this. Somebody's read this. Yeah, you can do some reading on this. That people are actually get, wanting to be frozen at the moment of their death so that when the cure comes along, they can perhaps bring them out of this freezing process and maybe they'll be brought back to life. Do you realize this is resurrection? 
Do you realize that this is what Jesus talked about thousands of years ago? That human beings are trying to bring about resurrection? That Jesus has said, there's already an answer to this. When you die, there will be a day when I come back that you're going to come back to life. You don't need freezing processes. You don't need any of that, right? And yet there's this hunger and thirst for people to say, I want to be able to live forever. Jesus said, you can live forever. I'm coming back. There will be a day. And when you see me, I will bring you back to life. And you'll be brought back to life. And then the question's going to be, did you feed and clothe and do all these wonderful things? Or did you not? That's the big question that we're all going to be faced with, okay? So you don't need to worry about whether you're, you, know, you can figure out a strategy to bring yourself back to life. Jesus is the answer to that. Okay? Now, one day, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to actually bring this separation about. He's going to bring this judgment. And when you think about this, when you think about Jesus and the, and the mode of his judgment or what, what he's doing, remember, he self-identifies with the least, right? Remember, his whole mission in life was to become the greatest, God himself, come and where was he born in a stable among animals he lived his life his life in such a way that when he would heal people or set them free from demonic possession they would be like whoa i can't wait to tell people and jesus is like shh don't tell people right i don't want you to i don't want this big fuss made about me right and he ends up going all the way to a cross the death of a criminal the death of a worst the worst form of a criminal right jesus spent his life becoming the least so of course he's going to look to the least on the day of judgment and ask the question, what have you done with the least? And by the way, he's also going to ask the question, have you become one of the least? Have you become one of the least? Because he's not looking for people who are great to do these acts of service for the least. He's looking for people who will be able to come and lower themselves to the point where they realize, I'm actually at the bottom of the heap and I'm looking up to everyone else. All the thirsty and the hungry and the homeless and the, and the imprisoned, I'm actually looking up to them because I have become the least and I have come to serve the least. And Jesus says, now you're getting the gospel. Now you're getting the kingdom. This is what I came to do when I came to live as I lived when I came to earth. So there is a judgment day and, and, uh, and, and uh, it starts with Christ, okay? And it starts, and, and the place to start is not in asking, how can I serve the least, okay? The place to start is, how much does God love me? How much has Christ cared for me? How much do I believe in the, in, the, in the transcendent love of Christ and the care and provision and forgiveness of Christ? How much do I believe there is? Because those of us that believe there's little bits of forgiveness that Jesus gives out and little bits of care and little bits of love, you know what we have? We have just scraps to be able to give out to people in the world. We have only scraps to be able to live and serve the world with and those scraps will dry up really quickly. But for those who actually get in touch with the grandeur and the power and the almighty God's love for us, that it is unending. You cannot run out of the love and forgiveness and salvation of Christ. It is infinite. And if we actually live in that place where we believe it's infinite and it's being infinitely poured out on us every single day, then there is no excuse for not extending that to others, right? It's when we start to believe that there's just little scraps versus an absolute downpour a torrent of love and salvation and hope and life that we then live in and we extend it to others. So the place to start is not in asking, who do I care for? The place to start is asking, how much am I cared for? How much do I believe in the love of Jesus Christ in my life and in, li and in the whole world? Let me give you a really t practical example. Elijah, when he came home from Halloween this, uh, this, this, uh, this year, uh, he brought this big bag of candy. And Shauna hadn't gone out trick-or-treating, and Eric and I, obviously, we don't go out trick-or-treating. And so he had this big mountain of candy, he poured it out, and he said, hey, anybody, you, you can have whatever you want. Just, let's just have a feast here, right? And there's this big mountain of candy, right? There's no problem. It's not going to run out. It's just like, yeah, have another, have another, have another, okay? Now here's the problem. <laughs> the next day or two days later, uh, we were all gone from the house, and Maple was in the house. It's our dog. And Elijah's candy was a little too close to the, cu to the cupboard, and she ended up, we came home, and there was scraps, and there was, and there was the, the bad candy left, and, and Maple had eaten all the good candy, and it was all gone, all gone. And let me tell you, 
It's a different posture. We, there's scraps left over. Hey, Elijah, can I have one of those three scraps that are left over? I mean, it's awful, right? Elijah had such a hard time getting over that. There's this abundance of candy, and now my candy's all gone, right? And if we believe that about the kingdom of Christ, and we believe that about the love of Christ, that it's all gone, or that where is the love of Christ, and we, we cease to realize that there is an absolute abundance that will never dry up, that it is all-consuming and overwhelming, and it's not a problem of the love of Christ, it's a problem of, of our understanding, our perception of our living into that love, okay? So if you want to start anywhere, you, we have to start with Christ's abundant love for us. Okay, And we see that unending pile of love that just keeps, and Jesus says, have some more, have some more, have some more. It's never going to run out. Forgiveness, have some more. Love, have some more. Salvation, have some more. Hope, have some more. That's Jesus. Okay, And if we, if we start to think in different ways, then it will totally impact our capacity and our ability to be able to care for the world. Now, uh, it's a sure thing that if, uh, here's, a, here's a sure way to determine whether you are living in that abundant love or whether you're living in those scraps of love. And here it is. Here's, here's two texts that we see two different people living in the scraps of love. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. Uh, and I encourage you to go home. You can, you can use this one. You can read it. And the other one is uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. In Luke 18, we have a Pharisee and we have a tax collector. And the Pharisee shows up at the temple to pray. And he's like, God, I'm so glad I'm not like any of those ones. And I'm so glad. And, you know, I tithe and I fast twice a week. Right? He's got all of it. You know what? He's relying on the scraps because why? He's self-justifying. He believes that it's about his own righteousness. He believes that he is up here and the sinner is down here. And then you have a sinner who's there stooped over. He can barely even approach the temple. Uh, he can't look up and all he can say is, Lord, have mercy. I'm a sinner. Have mercy. I'm a sinner. I, I, I don't deserve anything. And what does Jesus do? He inverts it. He says, that guy who thinks he's way up here, he's actually at the bottom. And the bottom in this case is headed for eternal destruction. Okay? And this one who thinks he's at the bottom, he's actually at the top. He actually understands the kingdom. He actually understands that the starting place of realizing and understanding and embracing the love of Christ is to actually bring yourself to a place where you recognize that you're nothing. Because the more in touch we get with the love of God, the more we realize our sinfulness. The more we understand the forgiveness of Christ, the more we realize how we are so undeserving of it. So if your posture becomes one of you're kind of up here and you're starting to look down on other people, that's a sure way you're starting to move into the place of self-righteousness. You're, you're forgetting the fact that you're actually non-deserving and it's nothing that you have to offer to Christ and it's all offered to him. The other text, Luke chapter 7, is uh, a Pharisee who invited Jesus for supper and a woman of bad reputation, a sinful woman in the town. And she comes and she is wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. She's brought perfume. And the, uh, the man who's invited him to dinner hasn't given showing him any hospitality and he's looking down on the woman and he's looking down on Jesus and he's thinking all kinds of judgmental thoughts about both of them and Jesus says this woman understands forgiveness she gets it because she recognizes she has absolutely nothing to give and she's walking away justified and you you may not have done bad things like her but you are doing worse right now because you're sitting here raining down judgment on another individual. You don't know anything about forgiveness, okay? You're living on the scraps instead of recognizing the absolute, infinite, never-ending love of Jesus Christ. So there is a reward. There is a judgment, but it doesn't start with seeking the reward. It, start with, it starts with recognizing the absolute, overwhelming care and love of Christ, that then we go forth from here saying, I am unworthy. I have nothing to offer, right? Because as we're going to find out in just a moment, the more you decrease, guess what happens? The more Christ increases. All right, uh, moving on from there. By the way, uh, to not recognize the care and love of Christ is to begin to live a life of, I'm all right, I'm doing well, I'm growing, I'm becoming better, I'm becoming stronger, I'm becoming more capable. I need Christ less and you may find that actually you have never really acknowledged the need that you really deeply have for forgiveness. That we need to constantly come back and recognize that it's not you becoming something greater and bigger and more significant. It actually comes back here. And you find that in the end, you have become, you have increased and Christ has decreased. 
uh, then, uh, you know, only Christ knows your heart. But the question of, have you received Christ by faith, and are you living in that faith? Or are you just living on your own capacity, and do you believe your own self-righteousness will save you? And it absolutely will not. And Jesus says in the end, you will go away to eternal damnation, uh, and that's not a happy place, and that's not somewhere that anyone ever, ever would want to be. And so I pray that, that you would come back again to recognize that none of us have anything to offer uh, except uh, our, our, our sin and, and ourselves, and we offer that to Christ. <sighs> Secondly, going off from here, that's like a whole sermon in itself. Do you want to go? We want to go now? Yeah, well, there's a couple. Of, these are really actually quick points. And, and Gord Cox, he's one of our deacons. He's going to come and just do, we're going to do a, a really, uh, a really um, uh, good Q&A with, with Gord to talk a bit about care and, and how he understands care. Uh, secondly, care is simple and practical. This is another great reason uh, why we should prioritize caring for the least, because it's so simple and so practical. Do you realize when you read through that list of f- feeding people, like giving people food, giving people drink, uh, 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 to look after people, uh, um, uh, to invite them in, uh, to clothe them, to visit them in prison, do you realize that a four-year-old can do that? Do you realize that we're not talking uh, high theology here? We're not talking like, um, you know, you need to have some sort of uh, um, master trade in the ways of Jesus. This is basic, simple stuff that you can teach a small child to do, right? That a small child can give another child or can give an adult something to eat or a cup of water. Uh, the, The small child can open the door. Anyone can do this, right? Anyone. This is simple. This is the basics of life. And so it's not complicated. It doesn't take anything. Any one of you have probably been doing this stuff or could go forth from here and do any one of these things in very, very simply. So it's simple and practical, and it makes it, uh, it, makes it really easy for us. Uh, so some of the basics of life, water and food, shelter, clothing, uh, hospitality and relationship, okay? Those, those are the basics of life, and that's all Jesus is saying. Are you doing that for one another? Are you looking to others, and are you, are you doing that and caring for them? Now, the other, the little caveat about the prison thing is today it's wonderful to be able to visit people in prison. The, the original context is a lot more significant than what happens today. In prison systems today, people will be cared for. They will, they will get food. They will get drink. They will get opportunities to exercise and those sorts of things. In the prisons of Paul's day and Jesus' day, if you went to prison, you didn't get food, you didn't get anything, and you may very well rot and die within days unless you had somebody on the outside who was willing to bring you food, who was willing to bring you the things that you need, the basic necessities of life. And so Jesus is saying, uh, are you visiting those? Are you taking care of those who have no other way to take care of themselves? And he's putting that on the shoulders. And why would anyone do that? Well, again, get back. Not, not because, oh, Jesus asked me to do it. That's not the reason. What is the reason? The reason is because I have been lavished I have been flooded by the love and care and forgiveness of Christ that it is absolutely overwhelming and unending and for the people in the world that don't even understand that, wow, like of course, why wouldn't I do that, right? It's just a natural extension. That's, that becomes the driving force behind our care that we're living into the care that's been provided to us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, caring for the least is humbling. Recognize that in the text, these people were shocked. They were surprised. When Jesus said, whenever you did one of these things, the least of these, or one of the, the least, you did it for me. And they're like, because the question was, when did, when did we see? I, do, I don't remember seeing you, Jesus. I don't remember. Uh, Jesus is saying, that's not the point. The, the point is, is that you actually were humbling yourself so that be, they, become, they became natural extensions of who you were that you were living in such a way that you were coming alongside of people and you didn't even realize it. It was just a natural thing and you were humbling yourself and you were caring for other people. One of the, one of the strongest message, messages in the scriptures is this call for us to decrease, to get smaller, right? Uh, John the Baptist says it, says it succinctly and beautifully. He must increase. He's, John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. He must increase, I must decrease. If you can get that in your mind that you are constantly decreasing and Jesus is increasing in your life, uh, you're, you're you're getting there. The Apostle Paul says this, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Okay, 
first service, I, I, I put Paul at the top of the list of sinners, all right? Let's say the list of sinners, but it's a hard... Let's say the list of sinners is actually where the, the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst, the number one sinner at the very bottom of the pile. So you think of the worst person you can possibly think of and lift that up, and you'll see the Apostle Paul down there. That's where he puts himself, Okay? That's how he understands his status in the kingdom. Now we're like, this is, this is somebody who's known throughout the world, the Apostle Paul, known throughout the world for the letters he's written, for the, for the incredible way in which God has used him to bring people to Christ, to begin churches, to take the message of the good news of the kingdom and spread it all around. And he says, I'm at the very, 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 very bottom. Wow. Would we strive for that position I would, I would like to take, can we say, I would like to take the Apostle Paul's position. I'd really love to just get right, a little bit beneath where he is. See, as we approach that perspective, recognizing that God loves us so much, that God doesn't say, I, I think of you less because you're at the bottom. God says, I actually love you so infinitely much that it has nothing to do with your sinfulness, my care, my love for you. But if you can acknowledge yourself as that, then do you know how brightly Christ shines through you? Because you're no longer trying to prove anything. You're no longer trying to strive for anything. You're simply recognizing that everybody around you is, is, is a higher status than you right? Then I'm the least, and you may be less, but you're not as less as me. And how can I see you as, as a brother, as a sister, as a friend, as somebody that, instead of, how can I come and how can I offer you pity, right? How can I come and how can I offer you the things that I possess, and I'm going to give them to you as somebody who's lesser than me? Do you see the difference there? That's not the way of the kingdom. And if we, if we're, that's how we can begin to understand the text, and that's how social gospel movements happen, right? That somehow we begin to say, uh, it's not about my sinfulness, I'm just trying to help everybody. No, it's, I'm at the very bottom of the heap, and, uh, and that's a good place to be. <sighs> so we need to realize that the more we care for the least, the more we become the least. And we see that in this great movement, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Jesus Christ, who being in ver- your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And being found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Right? That Christ Jesus made himself nothing. Jesus Christ would peel off the Apostle Paul and say, I'm, actually, I'm at the very bottom there. I'm right there underneath you, Paul, and I'm going to support you from that place. May we find ourselves way down at the bottom of the heap. There's no room for ego in care. There's no room for condescension in care. True care comes from an absolutely overwhelmed place of I am loved by God, I am forgiven by God, and I, I, I need to be loved and forgiven by you, and I want to love and forgive you, and, and may we live in this mutual uh, place of, uh, of receiving and, and offering. Well, Gord, would you come, and uh, would you share with us uh, some, uh, some of your perspectives on care? As I mentioned, uh, Gord is a deacon. We have a number of our deacons, and, uh, and one of the things that the deacons are charged with is care. So, uh, so Gord, talk to us a bit. I'm going to start you off with... Um, how would you describe what a caring church looks like uh, to someone who's never been to church? Well, I, I, uh, I looked at that question when you first sent it to me, and I, I find it um, hard to answer because I'm part of a church, so I'm talking about myself and my own shortcomings. But what I would see caring in a church is What, well, I'll use what I, in, in the inner service, <laughs> I'm an old man now, <laughs> I forget. Um, where's Caleb, is he here? He came in and shook my hand and I said, how are you doing, Seth? You know, so, forgive me, but <laughs> a, a caring church, we really do get to know one another. This is a, a, a relatively large church, and that's hard, I realize that. But um, I'm new to the church, I don't know that many people. I recognize faces, but I don't know your names. So I'm trying to make an effort, and, and I hope you do with me as well. Um, how are you doing? I, I'm Gord. 
And what, what, what's your name? It may be somebody totally new to the church. Will they just come and sit in a pew and nobody said a word to them and they're gone? All they did was hear the sermon and sing some of the songs. Or am I a person that will, I really don't know that person. Maybe I should go and introduce myself and just make sure that they know I really want them here. But that's hard, isn't it? But a church has hallmarks. A, 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 a church that really cares has hallmarks in its ministry publicly to the community, but in its ministry to one another. Each one is important. I love Zach. I love you, Phil, because you are faithful to bring Zach here. And we're not afraid to have Zach sit here with us. Because Zach is part of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Shannon is part of God's kingdom. We love Shannon. And we want to make absolutely sure that Zach and Shannon and anyone else, we pray for daily. We pray for Phil. We pray for Mark and for Kristen and for Addison. Mm -hmm. That's a hallmark of a caring church. Mm -hmm. But there may be a stranger who stumbled in and Parents, well, what's he doing here? You know, what, what, what kind of person is that? Well, you know, I just, I don't feel. No, we're a kind of a church that we don't look as people look, but we look as God looks on the heart. And we begin to say to ourselves, I've got to make the effort, and God's got to change my attitude and my thought patterns that I really care for those people that are here. Hmm. They're important. They're part of God's kingdom. If God loves them, I'm commanded to love them in the ways that Jason has already explained. Mm. Thanks, Gord. Can you tell us about a time, a meaningful time, when you were cared for or you cared for another? I was a teenager once <laughs> who came to church with all my friends, and we would wait outside on the below the steps outside the church till the very, very, very last moment to come into the service. And we'd be talking and fooling around and kidding and everything out there. And then the same after the service, we'd all be congregated there. But there was a lady by the name of Esther Reed. We were teenagers. She was probably in her 70s, mid-70s. She always sent all of the teenagers in our church cards at Christmas or a birthday or whatever. I don't know how she knew, but she did. And she would come up to us in that little group outside, waiting and waiting, waiting until the very last minute we could straggle into the service, and talk to us and engage with us. She was an amazing lady. And that always has been in my mind. I remember coming home from school and the mail, my mom would have the mail on the table there in the dining room, and there's one with my name on it, and there's a card from Esther Reed. Just whatever. Ellie and I had the opportunity to serve in the far north client community, way up far, about an hour and a half flight north of Sioux Lookout even, in First Nations community. And I just can't believe the care of those people for us. They had every reason to dislike us because I represented a department that really was very hard for them to get along with. But they cared for us. And the care of that community for one another. The dangers were there always. At that time in the 80s, people were still living on traditional pursuits. That was their economy of, of furs, uh, trapping, and uh, commercial fishing, and, and uh, hunting. And that's how they lived day to day. But the dangers involved with that in the wintertime, going out on the snowmobile, out on the ice, and a lot of families had lost family members through terrible accidents and tragedies. And so safety was of their major concern. I love fishing. And up there, they don't have fishing. They have catching. Man, do you know the difference between fishing and catching? Catching. You get it? You catch fish. You don't sit there and wait and fish around. For them. But anyway, <laughs> I was coming home. I was out by myself down, way down the bottom of the lake far away. And I was coming back, and you always made sure that you told people exactly where you're going and the exact time, and you didn't stray from that. 
I was coming back, and there's this flotilla of boats coming down the lake. And I could see the community dock, and everybody's out in the dock. And I'm like, I'm on time. Um, ooh, have I done something wrong? They're but the boats went right by me and kept on going. When I got back, I found out one of the fish planes, one of the planes that picks up the fish that has been packed and taken out to Winnipeg for market, had gone down in the muskeg. And they were going down to make sure the pilot was all right. Mm. The families, the extended families, those that worked at the nursing station or the band office or in the school, had a regular salary, and even those that didn't always made sure their family was looked after. The elders, there was no running water there. There was no uh, central heat in the homes. So the elders were always provided for. There was always wood outside their home to burn. And they'd take the snowmobile out on the ice onto the sled and a big 45-gallon drum, chop a hole in the ice, take your bucket, be 40 below out, and just load that 45-gallon drum with water and take it back to the house and take it back over to the elders. There was someone always visiting the elders, making sure that they're okay. The care of the community. Mm -hmm. Same coming down to Cape Croker. The care. We moved in uh, New Year's Eve. It was about 11 o'clock at night. The house that we were to move into was all locked up. There we are with my family in a cold winter night, New Year's Eve. And over comes this gentleman, Reg McLeod. Oh, well, I know where I can get a key. So he goes and gets a key and lets us in. He was an old bachelor, retired now, and struggled with alcohol addiction. But he just came over and made sure we were okay, and he would come over and visit us. He'd come and invite us over to his house for supper. He would cook it all and everything. But just the care that that man had for us, to look out for us and make sure that we were okay. But it went through all of First Nations community in the north, just the care for people, making sure. I want to throw a little hook, if I could take the time. Sure. About caring. As long as you catch something. <laughs> After we were married, well, the year we were married, I started school at Ontario Bible College, and the plan was that Ellie was going to have her PhD put happy through, and uh, of course we had nothing, but anyway, the Lord provided. But I remember. <clears throat> One day, I was going down the cafeteria, I had my bag, lunch with me and everything, and uh, I was, as uh, second or third year students, we were assigned first year students just to be uh, a friend, a mentor, a helper, just to be there with them. And uh, I was partnered up with John Hassan. John had been sponsored by SIM, he came from Ethiopia, and he took me to where he lived in his little apartment, which was about from here, to the guitar, to here, to here. That's where he lived mm. all year long. And he had absolutely nothing. But I, come down, I came down to the cafeteria with my bag lunch, and John came out to me and says, I want to buy your lunch today. Mm. Well, what do I do as a North American have everything person? Well, John can't afford that. I mean, well, no, John, that, that's okay. I've got my bag lunch here. I've got my bag. But I don't, I, at that time, I didn't realize the hurt that I created for John. Now, he was very forgiving, but he was offering himself to me. He had absolutely nothing, but he wanted to buy my lunch for me. Mm. And in my pride and my North American etiquette, well, no, no, John, you can't afford to do that. It's okay not letting him to show the love of Christ to me. But a caring church allows people to show the love of Christ as we get rid of our pride, but that's hard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's hard. The last question. Mm -hmm. Practical tips. Those are great. Those are yeah. great. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm always having to catch my attitude and my thoughts. My attitude that, you know, so often I'm willing to be, or I let myself be hurt by other things. Or I let my thoughts go off to silly stuff as to questioning or implying motives on other people. We do it all the time. I do it all the time. 
but as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, as Jason so patiently has been explaining to us this morning, as a person of Christ is the center of our church, constantly I've got to come back, God, forgive me because that wasn't really honoring you in what I thought or in the attitude I had to whatever situation. But that's hard. It's hard for me because I get caught up in it again and again and coming back to the person of Christ. But as Jason has tried to explain about the love of Christ, if you take a look at an astronomer's photographs of outer space, the depth and the vastness is just imperceptible. We just can't fathom how much is out there. Now, that's the depth of God's love for us. And that's the depth of love that God has asked us to take from him mm -hmm. and to start using in our lives. Mm -hmm. But it's not easy, is it? Because we get caught short every time but we come before God and realize his grace and his intercession for us. So let's be a congregation that starts to work on these things with one another. There's not one family here, not one family that hasn't been touched by a tragedy, some terrible thing, some thing that is there that is very, very, very hard to deal with. And that's why we're here. We might not recognize it, but we pray for one another and we seek to really encourage and be there for one another. Mm -hmm. That's a caring church. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Gord. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. As I said, Gord is one of our deacons. If you ever find that somebody, call, you pick up the phone and they say, hi, it's so-and-so, I'm a deacon with the, with the church. It's not because they're, uh, they're after you. It's because they, they are caring and maybe you haven't, they haven't seen you for a while. And uh, you can simply say thanks for the call. And, and uh, if you want to be prayed for in a specific way, uh, they would be more than happy to, uh, to, to pray for you and to, to walk with you through, through your times of need. Uh, worship team, you come. And let me just give you a couple of, of really practical tips as well. Thank you, Gord, for... Um, for those um, uh, great stories of, of being cared for and of caring and uh, some practical tips. Uh, decrease and humble yourself at every possible turn. So, for example, when you see a child, um, stoop down. Um, be interested in what a child may want to tell you um, because, remember, we're learning kingdom ways from children, right? Children have a lot to teach us, um, so try to take some time. And then assume that people want to be loved, even if they don't necessarily, even if they're like cold and rigid or standoffish, assume that they want to be loved and cared for. Let me finish with this, that um, a number, well, it's, been, it's actually six months ago or so when I announced my resignation. Um, it was uh, the long weekend in May, and uh, Pastor Amos and our teens were all down at Pitch and Praise. And I was sitting there, and, uh, and I looked over during the music time, and there was Pastor Amos. And I got really confused because I was already struggling within myself of like, okay, I have to preach and then I've got to make this announcement. And, uh, and in that moment, I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm here because I know it's like such an important, I want to support you. This is an important moment and I want you to know that I'm supporting you and I'm here with you. And I just, I, I was so confused and I thought, I can't believe it. I feel so overwhelmed. I feel so loved and yet I feel so confused about what I, uh, you ever have been hit with, like you're kind of struggling with your emotions? And afterwards I said to him, what did I say to you in response? And he said, you said, that's messed up. <laughs> you see, sometimes we can, we can reach out and care and what we get in return, we can get something reactionary that it's not, it's just because the person's confused or they, they're just overwhelmed. And we might take that and go, whoa, I shouldn't have done that. No, people just want to be cared for and, uh, and just lavish love and, and grace upon them. So let's stand and let's sing. They will know we are Christians by our love. We are one in the Spirit. We
baptize the least, because judgment day is coming. And if you are afraid or concerned about which side you'll be standing on, I encourage you, go to Jesus Christ. In his almighty love and forgiveness, he is forgiving you, and he's asking you to receive that forgiveness. You can simply say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive that forgiveness. Teach me once again. May I know it in my heart how deeply you love me. And may I go forth from this place absolutely loved. Lord, thank you that you call us here. Thank you that you receive us. And thank you that you call us to love in very practical ways out of a relationship of abundant love and abundant forgiveness that you offer to us. God, I pray that as we go forth from here, that we would first of all recognize that love, live in that love, receive that love, And Lord, that we would go forth from here knowing that whoever we come across, that we're called to be humbled, that we're called to be the the least of the least, and you will raise us up in power, Lord Jesus. Thank you that it's your work. Thank you that we simply need to be obedient. Lord, for those that are in need of a cup of cold water, that are in need of some food, that are in need of visit, that are in need of a warm, hospitable place, of some clothing, whatever the needs are, Lord, would you impress that on our hearts that we would know and receive from you direction and that you would lead us to care well for the people around us. Send us forth in your love and your grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So go in peace or stay and have conversation. Greet someone, say hello, and get to know someone this morning.